Lots of people pour big money into the features and traits of their house and the, for things that they'll enjoy, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that, but they don't think about or don't understand what's gonna provide value when they go to sell the property. So today we're gonna to talk about eight things that you can install and do all day long on, and enjoy on your property that you want, but it may not provide a great return when you go to sell the property. So I wanna help you understand what's gonna provide return on investment ROI when you're thinking about home improvements because you don't know what you don't know. So I'm gonna help you understand those I connect with people just like you every day to help them discover where to live and invest in real estate and sell property for top dollar when the time is just right for them. My name is Leif Jacobson. I'm an ex-cop turned realtor, also known as Safe Leif. If you're new to this channel, subscribe so you're first to learn about Colorado real estate. My contact information is below. I'm really excited to hear from you. Reach out by text, call, or email after this video. I'd love to connect with you or book a calendar appointment and I will reach out to you, whatever works best. So today we're covering the eight things that you may or may not know that provide not so great return in general uh, reference investment on a property. So let's cover those eight things right now. And the first thing that we're gonna cover is pools and hot tubs. Hot tubs we get in a cold environment. I've got one myself and I love it, but it doesn't necessarily provide a great return on investment. You're gonna sell a house and we'll talk about some of those nuances. And believe it or not, people install pools in Colorado when it's super cold, man, unless that thing's heated, you better not install a pool unless you're planning to empty it out and maintain and winterize it really well during our winters, which can be zero degrees here. So you can have all sorts of problems if you don't winterize that thing really well. And a huge, thing up front with those is the amount that it costs to install them. I mean, a pool, I mean, you're in the, you know, 40, 50, $70,000 to put in a pool minimum, depending on your location and whether you have good soil to dig down into or whether you go down and hit rock, you know, you may have to blow rock out of the way to install a pool. It can be massively expensive and generally, Pools actually do not provide in Colorado. You know, we're talking region specific here. If you're in Florida or Southern California, where it's uncommon for people not to have a pool, that's a different world. But when we're talking about Colorado specifically, where it's cold, you know, more than half the year, you generally wouldn't have a pool unless you're paying huge money to heat it and maintain that through the winter time. It does not provide a great return on investment. So you may enjoy it all day long, like all the things we're gonna talk about and nothing wrong with that if you wanna spend the money and do that but we're only talking about when you go to sell it, is it gonna provide a good return based on the money that you spent installing or in making those improvements? Hot tubs are the other thing as well that are not cheap to install. You know, you're 10 grand minimum generally for a hot tub. You can easily spend up into 20 or 25,000 for depending on the size of the hot tub and depending on the connections that you need and the plumbing that you may need in order to hook them up and power them. And there's maintenance cost with them as well. So we'll talk about a couple of those nuances here. Sometimes improvements like this this can actually be a deterrent for people because it costs time and money to maintain them and can be a higher risk and your insurance rates can go up. Uh, if you have one of these things, a pool and or hot tub, it can be a higher perceived risk as far as insurance and other factors or even just risk to you. If you don't have a fenced yard, some other you know person or kid comes in and you know drowns or gets in injured in your pool, it can, can be a massive liability for you. Even if you have a gated yard and or fences up, it can still be that way. So you need to be aware that some people are averse to those things. Some people will not buy a house because it has one or both of those things. So it's not a perceived benefit to everybody, even if you enjoy them yourself necessarily. So unless you're in a super high end area like Telluride, you know, Aspen, Breckenridge, where there's neighborhoods or areas where lots of people have pools, they're super, super high end, that's a different world. We're talking about the average general house in Colorado in the average and kind of median neighborhood is not gonna be the greatest investment. Colorado's climate is not conducive to that. It's just too cold most of the year. In general, for the average residential house or neighborhood in Colorado, you wanna be focusing on things that reduce complexity and expense in people's lives and reduce the amount of maintenance they have to perform, not increase the amount of maintenance and work they're gonna to have to do because that can be a huge deterrent for a lot of buyers. The second thing we'll talk about, and this is more of a principle or a concept, that may not provide great return are extravagant upgrades. We're talking super high-end upgrades in general. We're looking for balance and kind of tempering uh, things that you do to improve property. And when you go overboard, if you put in something that's too nice, it can actually be a deterrent. So over-improving a home with luxury upgrades that are not 
conducive necessarily to the property or kind of go above board. So things like, you know, a massive kitchen remodel, you know, if kitchen remodels can easily be at $50,000 to $100,000, it's easy to spend in a kitchen remodel. Uh, but for, you know, half a million dollar house, if you're spending, you know, 200,000 on the kitchen itself, it's probably overboard. So we want balance and temperaments here. Uh, similarly, bathrooms remodels can easily be 20 or a thousand or more. And for a bathroom upgrade, and you want to be kind of conducive to the neighborhood, conducive to the house and the structure itself, and not go overboard with improvements like that. Some other upgrades for kind of the average or typical home that would be considered a little too extravagant are super high end appliances, you know, like Viking. I mean, you can pay, you know, 10 or 15,000 per appliance for Viking appliances. I think that's a little overboard there, and it's not going to provide a great return in general. Luxury light fixtures and or fancy and smart electrical systems. I mean, some people have lighting systems in houses where the switches and timers and, you know, gradient switches and all sorts of programming systems are just too much. They're a total pain to use, and most people don't use the fancy nuances or go to the time to even program a super fancy lighting system. So I've seen houses that have features like that, and they can just be more maintenance than they're worth. And they're really annoying, to be honest with you. So I'm not saying in a super high-end house, super she-she, if you have it working really well and it's seamless and it's easy to use, then that's one thing. But for the average house in general, don't go super fancy on the systems. People generally don't see the value in that for your average house. Super elaborate or luxurious fireplaces are another thing. You know, specialty, you know, tiles or, you know, imported, uh, you know, travertine tile from Spain is not necessarily going to increase the value of your house any more than something you can get that's decent quality installed well by, you know, Home Depot or Lowe's. <laughs> Water features inside, super elaborate stuff like that. Uh, again, same same principle there. Or designer, you know, door handles and faucets that are way, way elaborate or made out of exotic materials. Yeah, not so much. Good quality, decent appliances that are relatively simple and easy to maintain and operate actually provide value. However, the one thing I'm gonna note here is if you put nice, gorgeous appliances in a kitchen where you haven't done any other uh, updates, it can be not so great actually, because one with one tenant we'll talk about here as well is that you don't wanna do super nice things in one area, and that's when I mentioned balance, and have other things that have had zero upgrades or feel super dated or antiquated. It's it's gonna draw attention to those things even more than you know a whole kitchen that's totally outdated in every component and aspect. People don't, they recognize it's outdated, but maybe not as much as when you have parts and pieces or components of a kitchen that are brand new and beautiful, then they really see, you know, then there's a, you're creating a contrast there and people are like, oh wow, you know, that is, wow, those cabinets are really bad. Well, they might not have noticed the cabinets so much if you hadn't put in those, you know, $22,000 worth of appliances. So keep that in mind when we're talking about balance. If you're gonna upgrade, you know, let's keep it balanced and have, a level of equality there in the resources that you're putting into an area and not go super high end in one area and do nothing in their other area. Another area of some high end finishes that wouldn't necessarily provide a great return are like super high end paints. And you can pay, you know, five times per gallon what other paints are with some, you know, 50 year guarantee on a paint finish. Generally, you know, if you're gonna be there forever, that's one thing, but if you're looking for a return on investment, generally it's not going to provide a great return for you to spend four or five times the cost on a paint coating. You want a, a good, decent quality of paint, there's no question, don't go the cheapest paint in the world, but you don't need the finest coating in the world that's imported from somewhere in order to provide value. And the other one is roofing as well. The roofing can be incredibly expensive. You know, you go super high end, you can have you know, solar panel tiles on roofs, you know, different than the solar panels themselves. I mean, the roof tiles are integrated solar panels. Yeah, I've seen roofs that are $120,000, $180,000 roofs. Generally, again, unless that's a standard for the neighborhood or you're in a super high-end area, that's not gonna provide a great return. A good rule of thumb is sticking with kind of universal, generally appealing options for people that are, you know, moderate to just above uh, high-level finish, but not exotic or extremely high-level, so not over luxury. So good quality decent professional upgrades on things but not necessarily going overboard too much because you want to appeal when you go to sell the property or you're looking for that return you want to appeal to a broad 
spectrum of the market and bring the maximum number of buyers forward, hopefully competing for the property, for the beautiful things that you've done and not going overboard or in a way that's going to detract or limit the number of buyers that we can bring forward. That's our explicitly in a listing as a, as a listing agent like me, we want to maximize the chance that a top dollar paying buyer is going to come forward and we want to maximize that pool of people that are interested in buying your house. So that's the overarching goal. The third concept we'll talk about are imbalanced improvements. I've already related I already uh, kind of relayed some of those thoughts, but now we'll go into a few examples of that being like kitchens and bathrooms sell homes. That's a common term that we're all familiar with or you've probably heard. But you know, when those areas are gorgeous and generally they do provide good return once they're, when they're done with, uh, with balance and with a reasonable budget and a reasonable install. But when you do those and they're beautiful and other areas you do nothing and there's no balance in that, it draws attention to the areas that are exceptionally out of date and creates a contrast that is not favorable to you. Renovating multiple rooms and multi areas creates a cohesive emotional experience for people as they're walking into a property. I say all the time and it's true that this is not just a logical, specific, operational, uh, technical process. This is an emotional process for people when you know, they're not just buying a house, right? They're trying to create a home for themselves. And there can be a difference between a house or a structure and something that feels cozy and homey and they wanna live there themselves and raise their family there and have experiences there. So we wanna create an experience for them and consistency and balance in the type of finishes and upgrades that you've done and updates is really important as they come through the house and the experience we wanna provide, again, in the end resulting in them feeling like, hey, this is this feels wonderful, I love the energy here, I can see living here, right? That's where we wanna get them. So we don't wanna do things that cause discongruence for them or incongruence, I don't know whichever word is right, or whichever is an actual word, but you know what I mean, reference creating uh, cognitive dissonance there and between in between areas. So how people feel when they're walking through a property is vital. So we wanna think about that as you're improving the property. And those things also play into making it a harmonious and, and flowing experience for anyone looking at it. And that maximizes the potential that we'll have the maximum number of buyers come forward and get the maximum chance that you'll yield a fabulous return on the investor property if we're making sure that things are consistent like that. The fourth area where you might not see a great return on investment is unseen improvements. Generally for the kind of emotional buyer who's looking for themselves as a primary residence, this may not be the case. If you have a different type of buyer, such as an investor who's thinking much less emotionally and much more rationally, for the average person who's looking at buying the home for themselves or buying the property for themselves, they're looking at things that they can see, again, because they're an emotional process and they're looking and feeling about how, how the property's energy feels to them. So you need to pay attention to that when you're focusing on improvements because people want to have good electrical and plumbing and HVAC systems. They want to have good infrastructure to the house, but they're not necessarily in tune to those when they're first taking a look at the house. They'll pay attention during the inspection phase when the, when the inspector has goes through those with a fine tooth comb. But as far as the initial marketing and interest we get, which is that general pool again of buyers come, that come forward, maximizing the chance that we get a top dollar buyer, they're mainly focusing on things that they can see. So you wanna have good quality systems in place, no question. You don't wanna have things in horrible shape or horrible, with horrible maintenance, or so old that they're likely to fail anytime soon. But going overboard, again, that imbalance concept may not provide a good return on investment if you go too nice on some of those systems that may just be ample in the first place. So generally, unless you need to upgrade one of those systems, if you need to, do it right. But if you're looking to maximize your return on investment, which is what our focus on is in this video, you wanna focus on things that people can see, touch, and experience. The fifth thing that will generally not provide a great return is excessive carpeting. So carpet is easy to install. It's a popular choice and an affordable choice as far as flooring because it's you know affordable and comfortable. It's cushy and soft. However, too much carpeting can be detrimental because carpets trap a lot of dirt, allergens, and the carpet fibers, and especially beneath the backing and even the padding beneath the carpet. If you've ever uninstalled carpet or pulled it out, it can be nasty underneath. And that goes through the backing of the carpet and sinks down in those fibers. So unless it's properly maintained, which costs money, man, uh, carpet is, it can be not such a great choice. It's susceptible to stains, so which it also it's not it's not as easy to clean and as costly to have a good legitimate truck mounted hot water extraction or steam carpet cleaning company come and do that is hundreds of dollars in general. 
per time and you're really you're supposed to do that. You look at the manufacturer's small print, you're supposed to do that every few months as far as carpet in order to maintain it properly. Excessive carpet can make the space look dated and unattractive as well, depending on when it was installed and what type of carpet you put in. You know, don't put in some type of specialty carpet that only would appeal or a color or a type of carpet, you know, from you know, Berber to cut pile. You don't want to put in a carpet that would only appeal to a certain type of buyer. Generally, people want pretty uniform in color and they don't want something that's really high maintenance or super expensive to repair or maintain. Some type of carpets are higher end, just to give you a little tip, like Berber carpets are gorgeous in general and can be super high high end and depending on what they're made out of, a Berber carpet has loops in the carpet versus a cut pile is what you see at most people's places where you see those carpet fibers. A Berber carpet is gonna have the loop of fiber in the carpet there and man, if you snag one of those, it's, it's over, you know, then you, even if you cut that, if you snag the carpet, you're gonna see that and much less if it pulls out just like a shirt that unravels, it's gonna run in a line on the carpet. So generally I don't recommend Berber carpets, especially for families, kids, you know, that type of thing. On the, on the average house, I would do cut pile carpet. It's much easier to hide issues or repair issues rather than Berber carpet. So just a little tip for free there. Typically, I tell people to minimize the use of carpet in general to the areas where we need an exceptionally cozy feel. And that's bedrooms in general and basements. You know, places where a lot of people are going barefoot and or basements can feel, you know, if there's you know concrete walls, you know, depending on the finish of a basement, it can be it's underground, it's getting less daylight, it can feel, you know, kind of dank or damp, they can feel kind of musty in a basement. So obviously you want to take care of any water issues so they're not literally that way. But again, we're talking about how, how energy feels here. We're not just talking about technically how dry a basement is. We're talking about how it feels and it feels cozy to people when they walk down there. So limit carpet to areas in general that need to feel cozy and where people are going barefoot all the time because it's not as nice to walk on a hard floor, you know, even a hard surface, even if it's not tile or stone, even if you're talking LVP, luxury vinyl plank, which is gorgeous flooring nowadays and highly recommended in areas like kitchens and main living spaces. I highly recommend LVP and it's, it's bomber, it's incredibly durable, it's easy to clean, but it, it can be very expensive. Good LVP actually can be more expensive than a solid hardwood floor, but it's way less maintenance in general than solid hardwood because it locks together. Generally, it's impervious to moisture and super easy to clean and can have some variation in it, so you don't have to clean it all the time, so you're not gonna see every little fleck of dust. The sixth area I wanna talk about, and I'll be very careful and respectful here, is DIY improvements. Improvements? that are not always done well or installed well. Unless you're a skilled tradesman or very good at what you do, I would recommend not necessarily installing kind of major components or fine trim finished carpentry type of components or finished components yourself because it's generally just not installed well. And people will see that, they'll feel it. I experience it all the time with clients where again, you look at the listing photos that don't show the details and the house looks beautiful and then they show up and they're looking around and thinking, oh, really? You know, about the, you know, the edges of trim, you know, don't match up, you know, dovetail, uh, you don't have, you know, crown molding, you know, it doesn't match up and, or, or there's loads of caulk everywhere that you couldn't see that on a picture, you know, caulk covers a lot of trim issues. So generally, I respect the fact if you want to be a, have a project or do a project yourself, that's one thing, but make sure you're super skilled at it. Make sure it's basically at a professional grade type of install. I would highly recommend that. Otherwise, it can deter because people walk in and the first thing they see is, well, I'm gonna have to rip that out and redo it or have a professional come in and do it because it doesn't provide that level of finish that I'm looking for. This goes back to the concept of perception as well. You know, even if you have very high-end materials, if they're not installed well and don't look super crisp and clean and how they were you know, looking professionally installed, people will assume and all of a sudden they'll have a more scrupulous eye when they're looking at one one piece of trim that doesn't match up or you know a piece of flooring that's you know sticking out somewhere or a seam that shouldn't be there all of a sudden now their eyes change and their glasses and their filters change as far as what they're looking for and now they're looking for imperfections throughout the house when they see one they're looking for 10 more it's just human nature we see things that are wrong more than we th see things that are right and they can get pretty myopic in rolling forward in their assessment of a place and 
they're looking for things to be out of line. Successful renovation and updating is all about, again, perception style is providing the perception and doing that authentically is that people won't have to do that themselves. People aren't stupid in general. They are looking and feeling and observing a property when they walk in and they can tell in general when something's not done well or done legit. And again, it can be a deterrent for them because the first thing they're thinking is, well, shoot, I mean, I gotta come in and spend 20 grand, you know, redoing this thing versus just enjoying that myself. So they're uh, they're assessing in their own mind, subconsciously and consciously, and with their realtor, if they're coming forward with a buyer's agent, they're a good buyer's agent like me is gonna point out, hey, you know, this doesn't this wasn't done legit and you might not see some good value in this here, so it's gonna cost you money to then redo it. So if you're gonna do things, do it right and provide the actual legitimate value with integrity to people so they know they're not gonna have to take care of it themselves. And that's where real value comes from is when they're perceiving the value that you've done something well, had it professionally or installed legitimately, and they're not gonna have to redo it themselves. That's where the value comes from. The seventh area where you will not see a great return in general is overdone landscaping. Again, this is kind of the, the exorbitant style when you go way overboard and spend massive amounts on landscaping, which can be hugely expensive. It can be super enjoyable for you, but not provide a great return. Curb appeal is vital when selling homes. There's no question that people wanna see a well-kept yard as well as a well-kept house like we've just been talking about. They wanna see maintenance that's been performed and love and care that's been put into a property. And the first impression that they have is a huge, sets the tone and flavor as far as a prospect buyer. But when you go overboard and spend a ton of money on those improvements, generally you will not see a great return on that. So excessive landscaping may not yield a great profit. The average cost of landscaping in a front and rear yard can easily be over $25,000. I mean, you can, I've seen people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just in landscaping. You know, well-kept landscaping can increase a property's value, but has more to do with marketability and velocity than just yielding a huge return. So it might get more people interested in a property or increase the velocity, i.e. the speed of the sale, but doesn't necessarily make you a good return or make you more money on the sale. Just like we talked about earlier with pools and hot tubs as well, we need to think about maintenance and upkeep costs, and that can be a deterrent for people. So super elaborate or high-end landscaping can be a deterrent for some people who don't wanna maintain all that. Cost of water is not cheap in Colorado, not because we don't have a lot of water, by the way, but because we sell it to about seven surrounding states. So there's a lot of water coming out of the Rocky Mountains, but it's not cheap to use it here in Colorado because we sell a lot of it and give a lot of it away. So maintaining a yard that needs a ton of watering various times of the year or all year long can be a deterrent to folks because they don't want to pay and maintain that. So when you're looking at return on investment for a property to improve curb appeal without over-investing, focus on basic landscaping maintenance such as weeding and garden beds and mowing the lawn and trimming bushes, having everything seem super clean and crisp. Basically a well-manufactured yard is better than something that's inherently elaborate or super high maintenance. And this approach allows future buyers to envision their own landscaping ideas and preference for the property themselves when they picture themselves living there, which is exactly where we want them to be, is that we want them to come, see the property, fall in love with it, and to be low maintenance and doable and sustainable for them is the, is the ultimate goal. The eighth thing that you will not necessarily see a great return on is kind of family or niche specific, elaborate, things in play structures, you know, like tree houses or, you know, play structures that are super elaborate or play equipment. Again, that can actually be deterrent to people in general. So wonderful for your kids. It's a great for a season of life. There's nothing wrong with having those. I've got four kids and my kids have loved things like that, but it doesn't provide a great return. It can even make it more difficult to sell a property. So there are the eight things that will not necessarily provide a good return when you're talking about spending money and investing in property. The bottom line is that good ROI is all about visible, articulate and balanced improvements to provide a perception of peace of mind and relieve others from having to pay for and perform those tasks themselves. So people can see through generally stuff that's not done well. They, the whole tenant here is that they don't wanna to have to do the improvements, improvements themselves. They don't wanna to have to spend money after the fact to doing this stuff and they wanna maximize the chance that you've done it well and done it legitimately. So hopefully that provides value. If you can think of 20 other things that I missed here, I would love to hear from you and love to hear those as well as other video topics. If you want me to cover something else, I would love to. I wanna provide value and content that's what you want, not just what I think is valuable to people in general. It's not about me. The YouTube channel is all about you and your needs and what you wanna see. So let me know, shoot me a text, call or email. I'd love to hear from you or book a calendar event and I'll reach out to you. I'll see you on the next video. I'm excited to talk to you more.